Welcome to the afternoon session of day two of CMIT's Foundation Anniversary Symposium. Our first speaker in the afternoon session is Sagnik Saha, a fifth year BSMS student at the School of Mathematics. Sagnik currently works broadly in the field of number theory and is specifically interested in quadratic forms and arithmetic functions. He had recently worked on generalizing a few number representation conjectures. Sagnik is one of the founding coordinators of the club and has been a constant part of it since its inception. He completed his minor in biology and is keen on exploring interesting applications of mathematics and computing in other fields. Apart from all this, he is very enthusiastic about keeping himself busy with photography, design, and web. His talk is titled Knots Are Noticeable in Not So Obvious Places, pun intended, where he will talk about introductory concepts in knot theory and their connections to other known objects. Over to Satnik. Thanks, Akshita, for the intro. Firstly, okay, let's try presenting my screen right now. Uh, firstly, I'm very happy that I am able to do this a uh, long time because it has been like six months since as a part of the club, we couldn't have meetings. So I really miss the board talks and discussions. So something that we could do as a part of two year celebratory events. So let me start with the topic that I am going to talk about today. From the title, you can say that I am talking about something related to a concept called knots. As we go through the entire part of the talk, we'll get to know that what exactly am I trying to do? What are the things that I'm going to explore? As a disclaimer, I would like to say that uh, I would totally not dive into anything related to fundamental groups or homology or complex topological concepts. I'll keep it very simple so, so that like it is accessible for all. It's a very introduction talk for the subject so if there is a serious topologist in the audience then they might know much better than what I'm going to tell today okay so this will be the structure of uh, what I'm going to present today so that it will be divided into five parts uh, so coming to the main topic is we are going to talk about knots so what is the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the word knot one very probable answer is a knot made on a rope it's a thing that mostly everyone has seen and everyone has done at some point of time in their life. And another very commonly seen thing is earphones getting tangled into themselves into a tight knot. So these are some commonly seen things where you will use the word knot in general. If you had spent your childhood watching Phineas and Forb like me, then you might as well remember the Aglet episode, which heavily featured the shoeless knots. But the point is, these are not very mathematically interesting. So why they are not is because if you look at the knots that you commonly see in your daily lives, they can be easily untangled. For example, if you see the rope knot here, you can actually pull out the two parts that are tangled together and then you will ultimately be able to transfer them to a normal thread. So that means however complex common knots are, there will be some way through which you can untangle the knot from its the current position to its initial form without the need to break the string. So that is uh, very important because we are not destructing the structure of the knot that we currently have, but still untangling. To make it interesting, what mathematicians generally do when they talk about knots is that they make the knot a closed loop. How do you do that? How do you make a knot a closed loop? So you have a string, you held it in both ends and you give a knot in between. So you have a common knot here and you tie them up in there. So now you, if you see this three step process, the last figure in the series is actually a mathematical knot. So this is very similar to the concepts of creating Mobius bands, if you remember. How, how do we create Mobius bands is that we have a common band and we attach the ends together. But before attaching the ends, we make one twist and that twist creates a single surface area. Here also we have a string and before joining the ends, we are making a knot and then we join the ends. Then we have a closed loop, but which has a knot inside. Uh, and if you to look at the structure of the object, you will see that it's not possible to untangle it in any way without breaking it. That's what makes it interesting right now. You have a knot and you can't untangle it without breaking the knot. That is the key structure that we are going to study for this uh, part of theory. And in itself, it's very interesting because knot theory is not a subject which is, which is usually taken up as an undergraduate course by people. And also this subject is pretty new. 
Northry has started like maybe a uh, hundred years ago, and the principal developments in the subject has been made only in the past few decades, maybe like in the twenty to thirty years. So that makes the whole subject very interesting to talk about. So let us go into some theory so that we can understand what are the things that mathematicians study while they're working in Northry. So first, we'll start with spheres. So we'll define what a unit n sphere is, which is very simple and a very fundamental concept that most people know. So a unit n sphere S n is a set which contains all elements in R n plus one such that the modulus is one. The formula definition might look very complicated, but it's totally not. Just imagine this: you have a unit closed ball in some n plus one dimensional space, and you just take the boundary. For example, if you have a R square plane, so you have a two dimensional space, and you have a disk inside. So you take the boundary of the disk, and that becomes your S one. So this is simply how we define S n. <laughs> It's just the boundary of the unit closed ball in the n plus one dimensional space. So similarly, if you take a line segment which is in R one or R space, what will be its boundary? Its boundary will be the n points. So the set containing these two n points will be S not or S zero. And very commonly, if you take a sphere in R three. Then you take the surface boundary of that sphere, and that will give your S two. Also, this is very related to the symposium because it's called S two as well. So anyway, so this is how we define S n, and you will see how this becomes a very fundamental thing for knot theory. So what does S n have to do with knots? If you take a regular unit circle, it's the simplest of all knots because simply there is no knot inside that unit circle. So like it's a thread which is joined. Here with the ends, and there is no knot made, so that's why it has a special name, and it's called a knot. So if you see a circle in your R two space, it's actually in the language of knot theory, it's a knot. So as we go through course of the talk, you will see how knot theorists want to classify their knots so that they can easily identify which knot is what. And this classification is very important because we always want to count the number of knots. So a knot is a very special structure because it's the trivial knot in the language of knot theory, and it's just the circle in the language of normal geometry. Also, like knot theorists or geometrists, like they generally like to create real life models of the geometrical structure that they work with. Uh, we will see how knot models are fabricated with the help of pipes and cylinders like this. But then always remember, knots don't have a breadth. Like as I told before. Uh, it's breadthless, so that means like this volume, what you see here, it, like is just a representation, so that we can play with it. So always remember, it's it's just a boundary part. A knot is defined as a boundary, so that means it won't have thickness or volume of that sort. So next up, we get into studying some important definitions, which will be helpful in studying more about knots. So firstly, we need to define what a knot is formally. A knot is an embedding of a topological circle S1. You already know what S1 is by the definition of S1 in the three-dimensional Euclidean space R3. So now, when I talk about embedding, that might sound like something different, but embedding is not a very hard thing. Like embedding means a space X is embedded inside Y. That means that X is contained inside Y, and there is a continuous function which injectively maps X to the space Y. So, what does injectively mapping mean here? That means when you see the space X as a subset of the space Y, then you have to always map, right? You have to start from the space X and you have to map the points of the space X to the points of Y. Uh, when you do this mapping, no two points of X will go to the same point in Y. So that is the definition of embedding. You have an injective continuous map which preserves the structure. In X, so a knot is similar to something of that sort. You have a topological circle S1, which you know, like it's just the cir normal circle, and you are creating an embedding of it in the three-dimensional space. Why three-dimensional space? Because as you saw, like you have to see this in a 3D space. You always have to see this in a 3D space. Although we started constructing this with the help of a 2D string, you have to see this in a 3D space. Exactly that is what the definition is telling. 
So secondly and importantly, knots are closed. They are non-self intersecting curves. So that means they don't intersect with each other. Like the knot, the example you saw here, they are not intersecting. They are overlapping. They are not actually on the same point. They are just one is obstructing the other because you are viewing it as a projection. So that means no two points inside the knot will intersect with each other, and they cannot be untangled to produce simpler loops. As I told that a uh, when you define a knot based on how many knots are inside there, they can't be untangled anymore. So there is a lower limit. When you define a knot, like this is the final structure, you can't untangle it anymore. You might be able to tangle it more, but you will never be able to untangle it to produce simpler loops. So now to give you more insight, you remember the last picture. We had a string, but you can start with just the S one, and you can cut the S one to get a two D string. Then you create a knot, and then you join the ends together to get a mathematical knot. So this gives you a better idea of how S one gets embedded inside R three. So now that you knew how to construct at least one knot, you had the exact process. You can do the same to construct different kinds of knots. So how will you construct these different kind of knots? Again, you start with S one. You cut it up and you make knots. Create like suppose you create a knot and then pass the string through it and then join it in the end. So the more number of knots you will create, the more number of crossings you will create. It will give you like different kinds of structures. So this is how you will uh, will be able to construct like different kinds of knots. So before we describe how do we see two knots are different, we need to define this particular thing called a crossing number. So crossing number of a knot is the minimal number of crossings in any knot diagram for the knot. What does it mean? So if you look at the diagrams of some examples of knots I have shown here, so you can see that this edge and this edge are crossing each other. Always you know they are not intersecting, but they are crossing. So that means in the R three phase, they are overlapping each other. If you see them on a projection. that is how we will define crossing numbers now the point is if you take the unit circle here you can actually like start from here and you can make a twist here i wish i had my pen to draw you here but i i can't do it now so you can make just a twist like just take a rubber band like for example you can make a twist in one end so that will also create that overlap like which is very similar to how a crossing looks like but then we won't count it while we count the crossing number why is that is because that can easily be inversed so if you make a twist in one end of a rubber band you can always inverse it and get back to the unit circle again but the crossings you see in these cases they can't be inversed so that's why when we define crossing number we call it the minimum number of crossings in any knot diagram so however you draw the diagram we have to see what is the minimum number of crossings in that diagram and we'll term that as the crossing number i would like to mention in between that if you have any questions or even any comments or suggestions you can just put it on the chat i will even take it in between so that i could explain it better to you so yeah back to crossing numbers so now based on crossing numbers uh, as i told before that we needed to classify the knots that we are studying so we'll classify all those based on the number of crossing numbers we have so for the unknot we have zero crossing number obviously and if you see this particular knot we have one crossing here one crossing here and one crossing here so the crossing number is 3 if you take this knot so while i'm showing you this knot you try to imagine in mind how will you construct this knots from a string and while you imagine the process of construction of such knots you will realize how are you bending your string so that crossing is happening and and that will give a very good idea how what is the topology of this kind of structures so for this we have like four crossings here so this is a knot uh, with crossing number 4 this we have five crossings so see this particular not actually might look like at times that it is composed of two strings but if you follow it it's always composed of one string so that is a kind of confusion that people all also have at times with mobius strips here also it's composed of one string but then there are five crossings and we term that it's crossing number 5 so now we have another structure with same crossing number with five like 
we didn't have another structure with crossing number three. We didn't have another structure with crossing number four. But for five, we have two uh, knots with the same crossing number. For six, we have like three different knots with the same crossing number. Another important point is to say uh, what to say is that what do you mean by these are different? Like they have same crossing numbers, but why are they different? They are different uh, because of the fact that you can't continuously change one of them to, into another. So if you can co continuously deform and go from this to this, then we would have termed them to be the same. But that is not the case here. I have a question in the chat which asks us, so how are knots created in real life if it should not be reversible? If I am constructing by bending, can it be brought back to circle right? If you, when you are constructing knots in real life, you are starting from a string, right? Or we don't start from a circle. In, in real life, as I told, like you, you can't start from a circle because it's already untangled. So that is the main point there. It's already untangled, right? So that means its minimum crossing number is already zero. So if you make more tangles, the minimum crossing number won't change. So that's why you always start from a string. And when you start from a string, then you can make crossings. You can make knots, how many knots you want. And then you can join the ends to make a closed loop. And that will increase the crossing number of the knot. So that's why you don't never start from a circle. You start from a string and then make it a closed loop if you want to do it in real life. Uh, yeah. So now uh, we need to define something called links between knots. So I hope everything is clear until this point where, until where we classify knots based on the crossing numbers. So a link is a set of knotted loops tangled up together. We saw individual knotted loops earlier. So these, each of these are an individual knot. So what, what happens if we tangle two different knots together? We we'll call that a link. And components of that are called like the link components. So a knot is a link of only one component. Uh, so see this example that will be very clear. So here we uh, have the unknot here, which is itself a single knot component. And then we have another knot linked between the unknot. So this is a link with two components. Similarly, this is also a link with two components. So this is how we define links, which is, uh, which is a very nice thing now, because now you can have like multiple knots, like you can have finitely many, but a huge number of knots and you can link all of them together. And, and that will create a very complicated structure. So if you look at, look at it from a distance, you might not be able to even guess how many knots are present there and leave it all like counting the crossing numbers and stuff. Two knots or links can be summed up by placing them side by side and joining them by straight bars so that the orientation is preserved. So here I am defining something called a knot sum. So how am I defining it is that I have two knots, suppose K1 and K2 are two knots. Uh, I'll just make a cut here and a cut here and then join these two parts and these two parts. So this is a bit different from link because in link, I, what I would have done if this was a link is that I would have made the cut in only one knot and then put that inside the other knot and join it inside. But in this case, I'm making cuts on both the knots and then joining their ends. So this is slightly different from that of a link. And uh, one very interesting property to note here is that firstly, this knot sum which is defined by hash uh, it's commutative. I don't know if you can pictureize commutativity geometrically, but it's very simple. Like if you add K1, K2 and K2, K1 is the same thing. Uh, but the crossing number doesn't additively divide. So that means crossing number of K1 plus crossing number of K2 is not the crossing number of the sum of knots. So if you, even if you add two knots and create a knot sum, or almost all the time you have to take uh, a new calculation for the for calculating the crossing number. Next, we'll enter into primes and find some connections between primes and knots. So as you know, like uh, what a prime is, a prime is a number which has factors only as one and p if p is a prime. You can't decompose it anymore. So that's the property of a prime. So given a number, it's a prime if you can't decompose it into further factors. Similarly, a prime knot or a prime link is a non-trivial knot. 
So remember what a trivial knot is. A knot is a trivial knot. So this is a non-trivial knot which cannot be written as a knot sum of two trivial knots. So that means if I give you a knot and you can decompose it into two further knots, like with the help of visualizing the knot sum, then those are composite knots. So for example, if you see this one, if I just uh, give you this entire knot K1 hash K2, then you might be able to visualize, okay, there we can create, create two further smaller knots. If you can't do that, then our knot is a prime knot. The similar thing also happens with links. So suppose we have two unknots here, which are linked together. Uh, remember again how links work. Like we have two different knots and we tangle them e with each other. Links are primes. Similarly, if you can't decompose them into two further links without breaking, obviously. So next up, we will define something called a linking number. Remember again how links work and how crossing numbers work. So crossing numbers where we would count the least number of times that the edges of the knots crossed each other. So linking number represents a number of times each component of the link winds around the other. So suppose we are having two components in the link, then we will see like how the winding happens. So for example, here, these are two components. One is getting winded around the other. We are going to try and count the number of winds around each other and then define something as linking number. For that, we'll have a rule, like this is a convention. So suppose uh, red and blue, these are two different knots which are linked together. And these directions are pre-specified. So suppose I look at this, like these are two unknots. And then I have just given them uh, directions. Like if you can see, they are opposite to each other. And then we see how they are linked. And here we have some rules for them, how we calculate pluses and how we calculate minuses. Based on that, we can calculate the linking number. So I haven't given the exact formula here. Suppose for this condition, if the number is n1, this is n2, this is n3 and n4, then the linking number is given by summation of n1 plus n2 minus n3 minus n4 by 2. But then the exact formula is not the point. The point is how, how we are defining linking number as the winding up of two different knots around each other. So I don't know if I went too fast, but uh, I hope I had defined a lot of nice things which I wanted to say about knots from the beginning. Next up is that I wanted to say something more which relates knot theory with the other well-known fields and one of it is obviously number theory and we uh, do something called arithmetic topology. But for that, I actually thought that I would be able to do that. But then I need a lot of tools. So there's a huge connection between the generalizations of this concept and some fundamental objects of number theory like factorization, quadratic reciprocity, etc. I don't know if everyone in the audience knows about quadratic reciprocity, but uh, one of the very important concepts in uh, number theory, which is exactly, uh, which is actually not very uh, difficult. So we have this notation for Logendre symbol. Uh, it tells that if you have a number A and a prime P, and then we decide if A is a quadratic residue module of P or not. What a quadratic residue is, like, let me quickly tell. Uh, so Q is a quadratic residue mod N if there is a number X such that X square is congruent to Q modulo N. You have a number Q and you are trying to find some other number X so that X square and Q are congruent to each other modulo N. So if that happens, then we will say that Q is quadratic residue modulo N and if it doesn't happen, then Q is a quadratic non-residue. So based on that, the Logendre symbol works like that. It gives you these values of 1, minus 1, and 0. Uh, but then to link this with the not theoretical concept that I have, I have to bring in few more concepts related to more generalization of knots into curves. After that, the, we have to bring in some concepts from Galois theory and field extensions and stuff. If we all do that, then after that, we will define something called the mod to linking number of primes uh, Q and P. It's a huge study in general. Uh, a mathematician called Morishita, they have been doing a lot of work in this area and there has been a lot of nice developments. But what I wanted to mention is this amazing connection. 
So once we define this mod to linking number, then we will see that the Logendre formula for two primes p and q is given with the help of this linking number. And after that, there will be a lot more things related to crossing numbers and linking numbers, which will relate number theoretical concepts into knot theory. And this is a very active part of research. Some months before, there was also a new development in case of Conway knots. So that that is a special kind of knots, and there was one unsolved problem which. Uh, what's being solved. Uh, so I just wanted to motivate people in that direction and tell them like how, what are the preliminary things of this area. So in the end, I would like to give some idea about knots in other places. As you can see that knots are fundamentally a geometric object. So since it's a geometric object, you will always find instances in lot of different subjects which deal with geometry, which will involve knots. One of them is DNA structures getting knotted. Those are one very important applications where you see knots and then we need to analyze how various functions are happening inside the cells, which are getting facilitated by such knots. Another thing that could be mentioned is that how enzyme reactions work. So as we know inside like living bodies, enzymes are like lock and key. So you always have a particular location where something else will come and bind. But then you will always, at some point you might need to uh, prohibit such activity. So how will you do that? So at times knots work here. So the binding sites, they will have a knot structure in a way that they might have a link together and they can break the link and then reduce their crossing numbers. In that case, when the new uh, elements will come there to bind, the binding will not happen anymore. I am giving very vague ideas of how things work in various places. In molecular studies, knots are used. In string theory, knots get used. So I guess I have given some overview of the subject here. Thank you. So uh, I guess there are some questions. Okay. Are the strings intersecting at crossings or do they have some separation at crossing? They are not getting intersecting. I guess I have explained that, that they are getting overlapped. In the slides, you are just seeing a projection, for example, here. You're seeing just a projection. So they are in 3D space, as I have mentioned. A uh, number of times the knots are like you see knots on 3d spaces so you are just seeing one face of it right so they are neither intersect intersecting or they are neither like this is not being cut here or something it's just a representation they are oriented in 3d space like that can i explain why you're using the word minimally number of crossing yeah i guess i have explained that is there an explicit result for finding the number of knots for a given crossing number uh, so that classification is actually something that people work on. So as I have given here, like I have just given like seven, like until crossing number seven. So as you increase the number of crossing, consider crossing number 10, then you will have like a lot of different kinds of nodes. Just constructing these nodes are uh, not the only task that you have to do. You have to construct a knot. And you have to see if they are topologically equivalent to any other knot of the same crossing number that you have constructed before. So these requires a huge like manual com computation, which is not like adapted to computers even. So uh, like it's not very easy to detect if two topological structures are equivalent to each other or not through a computer. So you can't just write a program and you feed them the crossing number and they can't like check even if we give them in like infinite amount of time they might not be able to check because such a concept is not yet developed it's still in the process of development so given a particular crossing number detecting the number of different knots uh, which are possible if there are like only finite number of knots if there are more possible or not that's always a open question for uh, like different uh, values of the crossing number for very small values, you can actually prove that, okay, these are the number of knots that is possible. Like for example, for a value of three, you can prove that you can't create any other knot which is not equivalent to this knot. So uh, I don't think there are any other questions right now in the chat. If anyone uh, wants to ask anything else, uh, I would like to take that. Uh -huh. So is there a relation between the factorization of a number and uh the number of knots that they can make. 
uh, yes uh, there is a heavy relation between that so that's what i was trying to mention so there are huge relations between knots their linking numbers their crossing numbers and factorizations uh, especially in the case of like large number factorizations uh, so there is uh, this concept of large numbers which still decompose into exactly two primes those are very useful in uh, cryptographic computations uh, like i guess in yesterday's talk also kalanser mentioned the same e those kind of things are very well related with knots and linking numbers but i can't explicitly mention that thing because it needs a good amount of background like both in topology and also in number theory okay if there are no other questions then unmute your mic and thank the uh, thanks sagnik for his wonderful talk thanks again for everyone for joining this this was the second talk of the day we have another talk by sunil it's at 6:30 i hope some of you will be able to attend the same maybe we can like we can end this uh, right now thank you everyone and goodbye